The world of work is always at the front and center of major developments, shifting and evolving to adapt to global trends. This has been observed since the first industrial revolution and other major disruptions that followed. Extensive ICT developments in cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and robotics raise concerns for the future of work, including workers' displacement and replacement and job loss. Meanwhile, the shift toward low-carbon, environmentally friendly economic growth resulted in the identification of green sectors and apprehensions related to skills and employment have been noted. Thus, discussing the promotion and protection of the country's human capital in the age of dual transition is crucial. The panelists for the academic community or from the academic community, research think tank, and the private and public sectors join us today. They work in the energy sector, data analytics, tourism, and textile and garment industries. Joining us today on site is Ms. Charlene. Hustim Baste, currently the OIC Executive Director of the Planning Office of the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, or TESDA. And previously, she was the Acting Assistant Executive Director and Chief of the Project Development Division of the same office. Good morning. Also with us is Mr. Sherwin Pilayo. He is the Executive Director and a Founding Board Member of the Analytics Association of the Philippines, the country's National Industry Board for Analytics and Artificial Intelligence. Welcome, Mr. Pilaya. Also with us is uh, Ms. Maria Cristina Aquino, an Associate Board Member of the Hotel and uh, Committee of Tourism and Hospitality Management and the NCR Regional Quality Assurance Team, a resource person for TESDA for the tourism sector and a star external validator a DTI Philippine Quality Award Assessor, and an ASEAN Master Tourism Assessor for housekeeping. For housekeeping, sorry. <laughs> now joining us online is Dr. Samantha Sharp, Research Director at the Institute for Sustainable Futures. She currently leads an, interna an international labor organization project on environmental sustainability in the textile and garment sector in Asia and other work on the sustainability and circularity of textiles. Welcome, uh, Dr. Samantha Sharp. Nice to have you here. We're also going to hear from Dr. Mark Curtis, who is an associate professor at Wake Forest University in North Carolina, in the United States. He is the lead author of Workers and the Green Energy Transition, Evidence from 300 Million Job Transitions, published by the National Bureau of Economic Research. Now, to start our conversation this morning, we will play first Dr. Curtis's pre-recorded video. Let us now listen to uh, Dr. Curtis's insights. Hi, my name is Mark Curtis. I am a professor of economics at Wake Forest University, uh, and I'm honored to have the chance to talk to you all today. I wish that I could be there in person with you or presenting live, but unfortunately, I could not make it from, from the United States. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the green energy transition and I will share my slides with you now and we can get going. So uh, this is joint work with Layla O'Kane who is at Lightcast and with Jisung Park who is at the University of Pennsylvania. And what we're gonna work at, uh, what we're gonna look at here is um, trying to understand the implications uh, for workers of this green energy transition that I think we're all aware is uh, currently underway and is expected to be uh, a considerable deal in the, uh, in, in the coming future. So I don't think I have to spend too much time motivating it, but I think we all, all know that the climate externality, that the cost of climate change is uh, going to be larger than I think we even uh, appreciated in the past. Um, there's some kind of 
uh, stunning recent numbers that have come out that uh, the social cost of carbon is now estimated to be around $190 per ton. Uh, and the implied present value of the marginal damages are now on the order of $6 trillion per year globally. So it's really expected that uh, climate change is, is a really important uh, and very costly phenomena that we are going to have to struggle with throughout the world. And addressing this means internalizing this externality. So it's a, this is using econ lingo a little bit, but we realize that we are going to have to address climate change, right? Climate change is an externality. We're going to have to address it. And even if we're not fully addressing these costs, even if we are partially addressing these costs, it's going to likely involve significant reallocation of economic resources. We're gonna to have to move and make shifts away from fossil fuels in doing that, it's going to require significant reallocation of labor and of workers as well. Now, if workers are all the same, if workers are all in the same place and transitions are frictionless, then workers can easily move. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're starting to realize that that's not the case. Um, it can be difficult to retrain workers. It can be difficult to move workers from one sector to another or from one geographic region to another. And so as a result of this, we want to understand what these costs might look like and whether or not workers are able to transition from uh, a uh, fossil fuel sector to a green and to a renewable sector. Okay. Uh, this is especially relevant given a lot of the discussion about labor market inequality uh, that is prevalent throughout the world, both in the United States and in the Philippines. Uh, where there is considerable polarization, there's cons uh, considerable differences in both wealth and income uh, among workers within uh, around the globe. Okay. So whether or not uh, this structural shift towards renewable energy is going to exacerbate or to mitigate this labor market polarization is still, uh, is still an unknown. Okay. So what we're going to do in this paper uh, is to look at uh, 130 million um, uh, longitudinal job histories to provide new evidence on the ability of workers to transition out of carbon intensive or I'll call dirty sectors and into, uh, into non-carbon intensive sectors, which I will call generally green jobs. So we're gonna try to say, okay, how often do dirty workers transition to green jobs? So is it the case that workers that are in carbon intensive sectors actually are able to transition to green jobs? How often does this happen? Uh, where else do workers in the dirty sector go? And we're gonna try to little, understand a little bit about the realistic outside options of workers that are currently in the fossil fuel sector. And then finally, we're gonna break down this into demographic groups. We're gonna say, okay, what sorts of workers and with different education levels, different ages, uh, different geographies, how are they able to transition? Are there differences in the ability to transition for workers of different ages and different education? All right. And then finally, we're going to look quickly at uh, whether or not job duration, so how long a job lasts, differs from dirty to green jobs to try to understand a little bit about whether or not these green jobs are good, uh, quote unquote, good jobs. All right. So um, I'm going to skip this preview of findings because I'm going to try to keep this to 15 minutes. But we can take a look at this quickly. Um, we're going to see kind of uh, really big increases in the dirty to green transition rate of workers shifting between these two industries, uh, but still this is going to be a pretty small number. Um, we're going to see that uh, younger workers are more likely to transition. We're also going to see that more educated workers are likely to transition. All right. Okay, so you know, this is uh, obviously, uh, you all are caring about this significantly. Uh, this is a big issue in the United States as well. So this is the from Gina McCarthy, the former US climate advisor, former um, uh, head of the EPA. Um, she realizes that reshaping the system, reshaping the economic system uh, means ensuring that industrial workers uh, can get the training and resources to build the clean energy economy, right? So that's what we really need. And whether or not these workers are currently employed in carbon intensive jobs can be a and whether they can be actually matched to, to these new jobs that we're having is, is not immediately obvious. All right, so to do this, um, to try to shed light on this, we're gonna use uh, data from, um, uh, job, uh, from job postings and people post their job histories on places like LinkedIn, on 
places like Indeed.com. Uh, this company called Lightcast has scraped all this data for us. So we have about 130 million U.S. workers in our sample, and we have about 300 million job transitions in our sample. Uh, and from this data, we're going to be able to observe job titles, occupations, uh, industries, fairly detailed information about the jobs that workers have had. We're going to define uh, dirty industries or fossil fuel intensive industries as workers that are in coal, mining, oil, natural gas, petroleum refining, uh, and very energy intensive and pollution intensive manufacturing industries like cement, uh, primary metals, textiles, paper, paper and pulp. All right, so we're going to define green jobs based on their job title, company name, and occupation. We're going to look for keywords like solar, photovoltaic, wind turbine, wind energy, uh, renewable energy. Uh, in addition, so we're going to identify as well some of the most important companies uh, in the United States for solar and wind. Uh, and we think in doing this, we can get a pretty good sense of which workers are in solar and wind. And then additionally, we're going to add on uh, electric vehicle type jobs. So we're going to find uh, the companies that are producing electric vehicles. You can think Tesla and Rivian as examples. Uh, and we're going to categorize them as uh, green jobs as well. Uh, we're also going to do this for battery suppliers. Right? So a really big uh, upcoming job source, and we'll see this in just a second, uh, is green manufacturing. And this is going to be a really important um, source of new jobs for dirty industry workers in the United States. And so we, as green jobs, uh, we have kind of a, a number of jobs. We have solar, wind, renewable energy. We're also going to add on electric vehicle and battery, um, battery plant manufacturing. This is a breakdown of kind of what our jobs look like. Um, so of, of current jobs, we can see that about 46% of green jobs are in electric vehicle uh, manufacturing and battery manufacturing. About 27% are in solar, 14% are in wind, and 13% are renewable jobs. Okay, so this is just a description of what our green jobs look like um, currently. All right, so let's take a look at some of these transitions. Uh, we're going to first define a transition as when a worker moves directly uh, from one company to another. So from company A to company B, we're going to call that a transition in our, in our data set. So if they change jobs within their company, that's not going to count in our, uh, uh, in our definition of a transition. This is only uh, workers that have actually changed companies. All right. So this is our kind of initial graph of the dirty to green transition rate. So this is saying uh, right now, number one, we're seeing a big increase in the percent of workers that leave dirty industries and that go to the green uh, that go to a green industry or a green job. So of all transitions out of dirty jobs, by 2021 we observed that about 0.7 percent uh, are moving of those workers that are transitioning out of dirty jobs are going into green jobs. And this is a, a tenfold increase just since 2005. Now still this is a relatively small percent of, of uh, workers that are leaving the dirty sector that are going to the green sector. So we're going to see you know, this is you know approximately one per, only pro, approximately one percent of workers that are leaving the dirty sector are, go, are going into green are going into the green sector. But this number is increasing rapidly, and we expect that it will continue to increase rapidly. All right, so let's break down uh, the same figure by the different types of jobs that dirty industry workers are going into. Like, what types of green jobs are they going into? Uh, and the big thing to notice here, right, so again, this is the same same graph, but now we've just broken it down into these four different categories, electric vehicles, wind, renewable, and, and solar. And the big thing that you notice here is that electric vehicles are seeing, uh, electric vehicle jobs are seeing a really big, big increase. So this is a becoming a very important source of employment for workers that are leaving the dirty sector. Uh, so you might say, okay, so what about, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's the case that workers aren't directly transitioning into green to the green sector, but maybe they're transitioning over time. Okay, so uh, maybe they don't immediately get that green job, but maybe you know they get another job, and then maybe a year later, or two years later, they find a green job. Uh, so this is this is asking that question. 
Uh, so each line here represents workers that left the dirty sector in a particular year, um, starting from 2018 going through 2022. Uh, and of course, for workers that left in 2018, we're able to observe them now for uh, for about five years. For workers that left in 2022, we're only able to observe them for one year. So we only have four quarters worth of separations that we can observe for workers that left in 2022. Uh, so the, the couple of big things to notice here. Number one is that workers that recently separated, like in 2021, 2022, are more likely to be entering green jobs right off the bat. Uh, the other thing to realize is that workers leaving dirty industries don't immediately uh, enter green jobs. So it does take them some time to actually, once they leave the dirty job, it actually does take them some time to transition into a green job. Um, and so workers that left in 2020, right, by 2022, it's the case that about 1.2% of them have entered, a, entered, entered into a green job. So now let's think about what this looks like by demographic, uh, demographic groupings. Um, so the workers that are most likely to transition into a green job are going to be those that are 25 to 34. The workers that are least likely to transition are those that are older than 65. Uh, this is just as a percent of transitions. So if you were to actually look at this by just the number of transitions that are happening, it is significantly higher for workers that are 25 to 34 than workers that are over 65. Uh, in fact, there are over 30 times the number of transitions for workers that are 25 to 34 into green jobs, then there are workers that are uh, 55 to 64. Uh, so we just observe lots more transitions uh, in general for younger workers. Uh, and so those sorts of workers are not only more likely to be entering into green jobs, but, but also conditional on leaving their job. Uh, they are also more likely to be entering uh, into a green job. So younger workers seem more likely to be able to make this transition. Uh, we also see that uh, more educated workers are more likely to make this transition. Uh, so workers with a high school degree are, are not particularly, high school degree or less, are not particularly likely to make the transition. Uh, workers with advanced degrees are. I think this associate's degree right here is actually a very important one. Uh, it looks like workers that have some specific training, associate's degree, it's not a full college degree, but it's more directed training, uh, appear to be uh, more like significantly more likely to uh, be entering into a green job. And this suggests maybe the uh, targeted training could actually help workers to transition into green jobs. Uh, there's also significant variation. This is again, a US study. So we see significant variation by state and who is transitioning to these green jobs. Places like California, the West, uh, Texas, Iowa, which has lots of wind, those workers are much more likely to transition into a green job uh, than workers in the Southeast. Um, if we look at dirty to dirty transition rates, right? So this is the probability that a worker leaves a dirty uh, job and enters into another dirty job, right? Um, this suggests that we have lots of workers in Texas that you know, they just stay to dirty industries, right? So uh, in the middle of the country, uh, you know, we have a pretty high number of workers that are pretty, you know, that are pretty, uh, you know, I don't want to say stuck, but that you know rely heavily on dirty industries for other work. Other uh, states in the United States, like Minnesota, if you leave a dirty job in Minnesota, it's likely that you're not going to. It's much less likely that you'll enter into another dirty job. So if we were to eliminate all dirty jobs, right, and that's not going to happen immediately, but if we were, then you could imagine a place like Texas, uh, Louisiana, the, the middle of the country, uh, perhaps suffering more as a result of that. Okay. Um, in terms of who this is likely to hit, uh, like if we were to eliminate all dirty jobs in the country, uh, then you can see that um, uh, this, this kind of uh, histogram right here shows what the outside options are for dirty industry workers with and without the dirty sector option. Okay? Uh, so the, if you include those red bars or the light pink uh, bars at the top, that's what the outside options look for workers uh, look like for workers when, when they have the dirty option. If they don't have uh, dirty jobs or carbon intensive jobs to go into, then their outside options fall significantly. And we see this across the income spectrum. Uh, so it's primarily the case with these middle income jobs, but we do also observe this uh, for lower income jobs and even a little bit for higher income jobs. But really these middle income jobs uh, seem to be uh, perhaps most at risk for um, losing uh, their outside uh, 
outside wage options. All right, we can do this for both college and non-college workers. Uh, we actually see it's fairly similar for, for both college and non-college workers. All right, so again, this is trying to get at what might happen if a lot of these dirty uh, sector jobs were to disappear. How would the option value that workers have actually change? All right, and we see that for college workers, the outside op removing dirty jobs decreases outside option by about 16%. Uh, for non-college workers, the outside option drops by about 21%. So it does appear that non-college workers are going to be uh, potentially more at risk if we were to remove a lot of these fossil fuel intensive jobs. All right, so this is again just showing a map. We do see differences for college workers and non-college workers and in the, in in the decline in their outside option. So if, if you're in the United States, uh, West Virginia is, is particularly vulnerable over here for non-college workers, as is Pennsylvania. And uh, one way that we can think about this is, are these stable jobs? These jobs actually last a while. And many factors determine whether or not a, a job is a, is a good job. Um, but one thing that, that we frequently hear is that these green jobs, uh, especially solar wind jobs, are not quite as stable, that these jobs don't last very long, that they're temporary and that they may not be as good for workers because workers are only there for a few months and they have to find a different job. Uh, so we're going to provide new evidence on this uh, by looking at how long these jobs last from our data. Uh, and so um, I'm going to go straight to, this, uh, to the final slide. Uh, once you um, actually control for really important things, including like when the job started, right, because green jobs are newer jobs, uh, once you control for when the job started, uh, there is really not significant difference, not a significant difference between the length of uh, green and dirty jobs. Um, you do see slightly shorter uh, length of job, uh, job length for solar workers uh, and for uh, wind workers. But again, this is you know maybe two to three months shorter when the average job length is probably three months. So these jobs may be a little bit shorter, but not, not particularly. EV jobs actually do appear to be um, uh, slightly longer, like that they actually, workers actually stay in these jobs a little bit longer. So manufacturing appears to be a really important source of of work for uh, for these uh, and good jobs for, for workers that are looking to transition. All right, so a few quick takeaways to, to finish this up. Um, so we use, uh, just to, to summarize, we're using new data from online social profiles from Lightcast uh, to examine job transitions and the probability that workers leave dirty industries and go into the green sector. Uh, we also use this data to try to understand uh, which workers in the, the uh, and the fossil fuel intensive sectors are at risk and whether or not they'll be able to transition uh, seamlessly to uh, these new green jobs that we're observing. Uh, so what we find is that uh, dirty to green transitions are increasing quickly, uh, but they are still a relatively small uh, uh, percent of all the transitions that dirty workers are making. So again, only about 1% of workers that leave the dirty sector are going into green jobs right now. Uh, there are significant differences in this transition rate between by age, by education, and by geography. Uh, and then finally, we see that green and dirty jobs uh, have roughly similar stability uh, by job length. So I think there's a lot to chew on here. Um, and you know, I think one of the we can see a couple of things. Number one, it's it you know this transition is probably going to be challenging. It's not the case that workers that leave fossil fuel intensive jobs are going to be able to immediately transition to green jobs. I think it's going to take some time, um, and it's not, not the case that you know even fifty percent or something like that of workers that leave this uh, this declining industry are going to be able to get into this uh, growing industry. Uh, and then. Um, you know, I think another big takeaway here is the importance of manufacturing jobs for this transition. Uh, we are going to see a really big increase in green manufacturing that includes electric vehicles, uh, that includes uh, production of solar panels, of wind turbines. There really is a fundamental shift that's going on to the, the global economy right now. Uh, and these manufacturing jobs, I think, are going to be a really important source of work uh, for workers that are currently in uh, the uh, the dirty sector or the carbon intensive sector, because those are the workers that we uh, really need to be thinking about right now. 
So that's the main, those are the main findings. I hope that some of them are applicable for your work in uh, the Philippines. And thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me to be here. Doctor Mark, speak louder. <laughs> so we heard terms like dirty job, green jobs, yeah. and of course, good jobs. Okay, so as he mentioned, um, younger workers are more likely to make this transition. But how ready our are our young workers, especially here in the Philippines? So for the first part of our panel discussion this morning, we'll talk about trends. We'll start with Tesla with the uh, Miss. Uh, Charlene Justin Baste. Let's talk about the alignment of the trends that you have observed, let's say in the Philippines or even globally, and how aligned are these trends with the training that you conduct at TESDA? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, pleasant morning. Still the morning. So pleasant morning to everyone. Yes, thank you for that, uh, for that question. Actually, um, we're trying. We, it's really good to see those trends uh, at the international level because um, actually uh, for Tesla, we are we really uh, ensure that we are really demand-driven since we are TVET, Technical Vocational Education and Training, should really be responsive to the changing and the flexible needs of the market. So we have uh, we are looking at all of these trends and um, we closely monitor this evolving job market and to align our programs to the demand. And currently, of course, uh, we're doing a lot of, uh, we're doing some researches as well as part of our work to really align our programs. So we have done some skills needs anticipation and the workforce skills through the workforce skills survey. And we've really seen um, evolving demand for the digital skills, for the health, there's also for agriculture and construction and the tourism sector. So we have seen emerging demands for these uh, sectors. And of course, at the national, we're also looking at the trend, um, the, the economic sectors. Of course, there's really uh, higher demand or increasing demand for the services sector. So those are things that we are looking at. And we'd also like to, uh, we have now the national TSD plan, which we have recently launched. And this plan really envisions a globally recognized event that is really responsive for, that is responding to lifelong learning and transformation for the socioeconomic transformation of the country. So these are the things that I think um, as part of the education sector should really be doing. We have to be uh, responsive, uh, especially this uh, dual transition. The NTSDP is actually looking at, uh, I, mean, I mean, even before uh, we have been discussing about this, we have developed the green greening the technical vocational education framework by actually having this framework so that we are able to uh, develop our training regulations or standards that is responsive to what the industry needs, especially for the green, the green economy or the circular economy. And then in terms of the digital transition, um, some of our, we have embedded uh, the digital skills and some of our trainers are also trained in terms of doing the digital, uh, having the digital competency so that they'll be able to transform this to our uh, students, our learners in general. So uh, basically, um, I think we're, we're somehow ready. We're, we have this in the plan. Uh, the dual transition is part of our priority. Um, uh, we have uh, the different modalities as well to respond to this. So um, the four IR framework as well, so that for this digital skill. So um, yeah, that's that's it for now uh, for, okay. <laughs> for this discussion. Maybe we should add later on. Okay, before I go to Dr. Samantha Sharp, uh, who is with us uh, online, I'd like to do uh, to ask a short follow-up question. Because when you talk about TESTA, basically we're dealing with short courses, yeah. uh, training courses. But how flexible is TESTA in terms of adapting, adopting to, let's say, certain trends that become available? Um, we're trying to do that now with our uh, some of our programs. We have the micro-credential program. So that this is really a response to the upskilling and reskilling, especially for those industries that have are really changing very quickly so that we can, it's really for the upscaling of those in the IT 
in the IT sector, those in the electronics, so that we, could, we are really responding to them. Um, we are trying to also do so. I know um, some of you would, would say that it's some have experience with this. Uh, it, took, it took us, uh, I think, about a year to develop uh, standards because we also do this with the industry. But with this, um, to really respond to this, we're doing now the adopt and adopt framework. So looking at all the existing standards now, um, we're looking at the world scales standard so that it's something that's already there that will just uh, adapt to what we are, we can really use uh, at the national level. So those are the uh, things that we would want to be more, so that we will be more flexible in terms of doing all of these standards. And um, with our area-based approach, um, there are things that uh, that are needed by the specific locality. So what we do now is develop the competency standards. So it's a shorter uh, duration uh, I mean, in terms of development. So that's very specific. So that's something that's really uh, we're doing so that um, we're not be doing the full regulations that would take us a year to develop. And then when we develop it, it's already obsolete. <laughs> that was what I was trying to drive at because <laughs> bureaucracy might, uh, <laughs> might spoil everything. Okay, let's go to Dr. Uh, Samantha Sharp. In your work in sustainability and circularity in the textile and garment industry, which particular trends have you observed and uh, how do you see digit digitization affecting these trends? Sure, thank you. And just to say it's a pleasure to be with you um, virtually today. Um, I, I would say sustainability and circularity are really dominant trends in the textile and garment sector. Um, you know, it's the garment sector is, is one of the most complex and globalised supply chains of any commodity uh, across the world. And we think it's you know, was the, the reason for the Industrial Revolution. It was one of the first to globalise and it's really played uh, a unique role in um, economic development and it employs a lot of people, so mainly women as well, uh, directly about 75 million. But if we took a value chain approach, um, so including all the growing of producing of raw materials all the way through to retail and also dealing with waste, textiles and garments, which is now very important. It's probably about 400 million people worldwide. So that's one in eight workers. So we're talking about a massive sector that really um, has, has a critical impact on the sustainable development of many countries. Um, and, you know, it's not without its problems. We all kind of know a lot of the social and environmental challenges and uh, being able to adopt sustainability and circularity are really testing this this sector because you know one of the reasons it's been so successful is the the long and complex supply chains many countries involved that make circularity and sustainability important uh, difficult. Um, also, the business model so high volume, low cost, fast fashion. Um, so. If we think about sustainability, it's so using less resources, reducing environmental impacts, achieving the SDGs, and circularity is, I guess, one aspect of doing that. So it's, um, as the colleague earlier talked about, you know, it's really changing the way that we use materials so that they cycle through rather than we have this linear take, make, dispose, that materials will actually cycle so we won't have waste. Uh, byproducts of one sector will become inputs for another. Reuse, uh, resale, repurposing will also become more, much more important. So if we think about those types of activities, they require us to have new new information and new knowledge. Um, so if you're a garment company, then you want to become circular. You need to have really detailed information about what's in your inputs, what fabrics, how were they made, what thread was used. Um, so you have to have a really good uh, relationship with your supplier and you also have to have a really good relationship with your customers because if you want to achieve circularity through extended producer responsibility, you have to be able to offer them extra services about repair or resale. Uh, you need to know where they are and where that product is. And so digitalization enables a lot of these activities. Um you know, out of the European Union and their sustainable textiles, we're starting to talk about a, a, a product passport, which is essentially a digital passport that says what's in different products and how they were made. Uh, so that means everyone along the supply chain can can um, 
can know what's in those products and develop their circular strategies. Um, they can also, digitalization can also help uh, with reducing materials. So can enable new business models such as on-demand production. And so that can, um, you know, eliminate or minimize kind of those uh, production overruns, which uh, creates a lot of waste. Um, can also help us deal with some of the the labor aspects, uh, social sustainability aspects in the in the uh, supply chain. So, enable greater supply chain transparency. Um, so we can know where things were made and we can know uh, who the workers were and whether they were paid, um, you know, good good salaries. Um, and that can hopefully enable some more sustainable procurement and sourcing strategies. Um, Digitalization can also have downsides. Um, I don't know if many people are familiar with the ultra fast fashion models, but these are essentially driven by digital platforms. Um, and so this can be increasing consumption, kind of making it harder for us to introduce circularity. Um, and it's also complex um, and requires new skills and capabilities. So again, how do we develop those in a a really large and complex supply chain, which includes, you know, a wide spectrum of actors, international brands through to SMEs. So how do we ensure that um, digital capabilities uh, or opportunities to develop those are equally shared? Okay, thank you, Samantha. By the way, after this round, we'll be entertaining questions from the uh, audience. So get ready with your questions. Let's now go to uh, Ms. Aquino. Let's talk about the uh, tourism and hospitality uh, sector. So how basically is the sector fading in terms of uh, green and the digital economy? Okay, thank you very much. Just uh, let's talk numbers first. In terms of GDP, uh, tourism actually contributed around 6.2%. In terms of employment, we're around like the share is around 11.2, uh, which translates around 5.4 million. Uh, if you're talking about higher education institutions, they're like close to a thousand higher education institutions that actually offer tourism and hospitality programs with a combined enrollment of around 200,000, close to 300,000 students. So that's, that's the breadth and width of the industry. But in terms of uh, green and digital uh, economy or uh, initiatives that we have, we're very happy to see that uh, the DOT has actually uh, made this made it already part of their accreditation standards. And so this is something that schools must bear in mind. Unfortunately though, the policies, policy standards and guidelines, which are program standards and guidelines for the curriculum of tourism uh, is already more than five years old. It was 2017 when we rolled it out. I'm now using my hat as a member of the technical committee, but it doesn't really uh, limit any school in making sure that course uh, outlines are actually updated every year. The biggest transition really happened in 2020 with COVID. A lot of uh, hotels, a lot of restaurants, a lot, a lot of travel agencies have incorporated uh, uh, new processes. There were a lot of digital transformation that happened. A lot of green initiatives have happened already. And so it is now very incumbent in many schools to actually make sure that the faculty members are aware of these new initiatives to make sure that these are inputted into the curriculum, into the uh, daily uh, uh, classes that they have. Um, many of the faculty members, though, uh, may not have as much connection in industry or may not even have industry experience at that. And so the books that they use may not be rich in this in its initiatives right now. And so whenever I go for any opportunity to discuss or to be a speaker, if you're using books that are reference materials that are older than 2020, you've got to junk it already because then it's outdated because schools are supposed to represent what industry has. You prepare them for what eventually will be the jobs or maybe the uh, business prospects that they will have. Uh, tourism is, uh, I think, very... Uh, I was uh, listening to the discussion about what dirty jobs, uh, clean jobs, etc. The, uh, the, the, the tourism is actually what? Uh, multi industry. You don't think of the tourism industry as just the hotels or just the food and beverage. They have a lot of uh, 
products and services that come from different uh, industries, like textile, like uh, products, etc. And so they have. We have to make sure that everyone is into the same mindset to make sure that students are aware as early on when they're still in school. Uh, I was just looking at the numbers from DepEd all the way to uh, technical, vocational, and higher education. DepEd has around 26 million students uh, uh, from around 10 or 12,000 million schools, 12,000 schools uh, with free education at that. The curriculum really has to be very strong as early as uh, basic education. Uh, remember that the output of basic education is the input now for te technical vocational or for higher education. So if it's not strong, if it's not present as early as basic education, you'll have to start from step one in higher education, which again, um, uh, already is a very big challenge because you've got a lot of courses that you put in in higher education alongside professional subjects, general education, et cetera. Uh, I was just looking at the curriculum and I was saying to uh, Sir uh, Pelayo earlier on that we think in silos. This is just going to be my subject. This is going to be my course, et cetera. But when you talk about like, Currently, sustainable tourism is one subject in higher education, specifically in tourism. But if you take a look at sustainable tourism, it is not just the job of maybe a tourism travel tourism officer. It's the job of everyone, whether you're in front office, in house cook, housekeeping, in food and beverage services, in travel agencies, etc. Everybody has to have a finger in sustainable tourism, digital transformation, and so on. So tourism... I think is uh, faring well because we've got to make sure that the numbers are there, but there has to be a lot of push really, not just from, as somebody said, it's not government is going to be doing it. It's also private. And so private has to also bring their, uh, uh, their marshals to court to make sure that industry is able to say, this is what we need. And education should listen. We cannot just work outside with uh, work within our sector. And I'm very happy that tourism is very fortunate to have what we call the convergence. Uh, the DOT brought along, form a convergence of uh, DepEd, Technical Vocational Skills Development Authority representatives, together with higher education and the Tourism Industry Board Foundation Incorporated, which is a industry board for tourism. And we're working alongside to make sure that the curriculum, uh, the initiatives are actually brought in as early on in basic education all the way to higher education. I hope I answered your question more than. <laughs> more than answer the question. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive response. Let's now go to Sherwin. Let's talk about the trends uh, in data analytics and artificial intelligence and which of these trends can be most useful to the workforce in terms of the green and digital transition. I think that's very uh, simple to answer. It's generative AI. I mean, that's the, the inner thing. If I ask everyone in this room who has not used chat GPT, no one will probably raise the, their hands. Um, in, our, uh, in a recent study that we, that Access Partnership did uh, with AAP and uh, Microsoft, uh, we, um, it's the, the, the title of the paper, the economic impact of generative AI in the Philippines. There was an estimated $79.3 billion of productive capacity that can be unlocked by AI. When you say productive capacity, it means actually the reduction of you know, manual work because of the automation that generative AI uh, can bring. So that it actually really helps us be more efficient in the way that we are uh, doing. What it does also say is that um, it doesn't really have to replace you know, workers, it just have to, we just have to shift our focus on the, the, the work that we are doing. We're talking about dirty jobs, you know, the only people that can really clean the dirty jobs are those in that sector uh, as well. So they really just have to use, you know, tools such as, you know, ChatGPT, you know, any generative AI tool to clean those dirty uh, jobs. 
Um, so we're actually working with Tesda a lot, at, um, Ched uh, and, and DepEd. I was going to comment earlier about Charlene, you know, mentioning about, you know, how fast we can actually create competency standards now. Um, and I actually owe Tesda some work. Uh, but we're actually creating competency standards in data analytics fundamentals and even prompt engineering. And what is used to take about a year, we're actually compressing it about one and a half months. So we're going to release competency standards already on prompt engineering and data analytics fundamentals. Um, and it's not only going to be for those who are going to develop products because we need users also of AI to know all of these things, okay? Um, we, we want to decrease the digital divide by having this AI tools available to everyone, not just the, the technical uh, people. But on the other hand, um, the use of uh, this tool should also have um, some, we, we need to put in some efficient use of these tools. You know, Sus Susan showed some um, kind of the, the negative impacts of generative AI. They use so much um, uh, computing power, energy consumption is very high, uh, the use of water to cool those machines are pretty high. Uh, Chat GPT actually is estimated to emit 8.4 tons of carbon dioxide, uh, and that's more than twice what a human would uh, do in, you know, uh, in, in a year's time. So imagine if every one of us use Chat GPT, uh, or there are more companies who are going to use generative AI. It's like putting in twice the number of people in the plan in the, the planet, and you know, as we know. We cannot do that anymore. Our planet can do that. So the efficient use of these tools is very important uh, as well. It's not important that you just need to type, okay, I need this. Uh, create me an outline for um, um, uh, the, the best um, uh, replacement for plastics. Okay. One question in chat GPT would already use so much computing uh, power that it'll affect the environment. Prompt engineering is not just about grammar or proficiency in linguistics. You know, you need to put in the context of what you need, uh, ChatGPT. You need to be very, very specific. So you could use ChatGPT for as the shortest time uh, uh, possible. Uh, for those of us who have been, you know, um, I think experienced programming in mainframe, and I'm looking at Mon, you know, during the time, when we were taught about programming, we were taught about the rigor of programming. And we actually count the number of times we compile our programs in the mainframe because using mainframe is very, very expensive. So I think it's going to be similar to us. Even if we have all of these automated tools, we need to be very, very efficient in the use of these tools as well. So that's quite an oxymoron. I think that was mentioned uh, earlier during the <laughs> discussion. This one fleshes it out uh, even more. Uh, we'll entertain questions from the crowd, from the audience, but first we'll uh, entertain questions from the Fuller Hall. So how do we go about it? We'll... Okay. Are there questions from uh, the Fuller Hall? Okay, I think they're still fixing the the tech issues. Uh, any question from the from the audience? All right, ready now. All right, now. Hello. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, please Hello. introduce yourself first. Okay. All right. Um, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, okay. Um, I'm Palma from uh, from PIA, and this is the question. I think this is more on the, the previous speakers. However, uh, this will be the, the concern. Um, we all know that uh, labor and um, operational costs are, are high when we talk about a circular economy, particularly in the, the Philippines. So 
what will be the recommendation of the speaker when it comes to promoting this type of economy considering this, um, these barriers, especially uh, when it comes to the manufacturing industry and um, other related industries that is also uh, high in uh, manpower and uh, operational cost? Thank you. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, anybody would like to get the first crack or okay okay dr ilia thank you so much okay i think the the circular transition would would actually provide that answer because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the circular uh, models of the economy is, is actually more uh, labor in, uh, less labor intensive compared to the linear models. Therefore, if companies are able to uh, uh, resort to using circular models okay, in their operations, I think that the reduction in labor costs would, would, would come as a result of that. And because primarily uh, of the of the the, the technologies involved, right, in, in, in the transition. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to respond to that? How about Dr. Sharp in the context of the garments and textile uh, industries? Sure, yes. Um, and I think that's circular is initially going to be more expensive, uh, definitely. And But I think um, what... What many organizations learn is you can't be circular by yourself. You have to be circular in a sector, in an economy, in a geography. And so um, really to, I guess, unlock the benefits of circularity, you need that supply chain governance or that, those strategies at a city scale or a country scale that enable those connections to be made because until they're, they're there and, you know, it's really important that intermediaries um, – such as the new the new center that was has been announced, help de-risk and help build information and new knowledge that enables uh, different companies to make the steps towards circularity. But you know, it will be costly to begin with, and but there's also advantages around first mover uh, innovation. So there's there's both benefits uh, as as well as costs. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Sharp. Uh, other questions from the audience. You can now entertain questions from this hall. Anybody? None yet? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's move to the uh, next round of questions here. Uh, let's uh, start with uh, Ms. Uh, Hustim Bastem. So, which particular sectors are critical in the Philippine green and digital economy? And what skills and training gaps must be addressed to prepare workers for this? Um. Based on our workforce skills survey, the, uh, the skills is anticipation. So it's, uh, we're looking at the renewable energy, um, sustainable agriculture, and ecotourism are becoming, they are, I think, they're critical uh, sectors that we should be looking at. So we are uh, developing more programs for this since these are identified also as, uh, we have identified some of the emerging uh, skills and in-demand skills for this particular uh, 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 sectors that are really we're looking at green. Um, also, in terms of the digital economy, so we see, of course, this in the IT, the data analytics, the cybersecurity, the ones that we're also doing, and um, these are the uh, the cybersecurity skills, as I mentioned. So um, we are doing some of the the ones that we are developing now for this, as I mentioned, the ones that are really more responsive and agile. So we're doing some micro-credential courses for this and some uh, competency standards. Uh, specifically for the uh, renewable energy, we have uh, recently developed now a competency standards for the fully powered, uh, fully uh, powered, uh, battery-powered uh, electric vehicle uh, level two. Uh, service, servicing level two. So that's one uh, that's one response that we have now for the electric vehicle app. And um, we have uh, already in, embedded some of the green competencies in some of our 89 training regulation. And this would also include, of course, uh, the common uh, the green components in terms of also the uh, preparedness, I mean, 
5S, uh, the, the ones that are also being uh, asked by that uh, occupational safety. So it's being included there. And uh, we have a solar powered and uh, solar powered and uh, uh, solar powered training regulations as well. And um, with the green Tibet framework, so um, we have uh, we have this uh, implemented among our institutions since TESA has 178 training, technology training institutions. And we have tried to really um, make them uh, adhere to this green Tibet framework by looking at their standards, um, the adhering to green competencies that such as they are also doing it in their institutions. Um, we have, I think, some innovations there would be having their solar powered uh, irrigation system in some of their uh, these trading institutions for agriculture and the tourism. So um, somehow um, this uh, development and uh, aside from this, of course, I uh, would like to that part of the priorities, of course, are these priority sectors that we have already identified. Um, this uh, we have developed this and we have embedded some of the competency standards and we have a, we are also part of the Green Jobs Act. So part of that is we have to include. Uh, the in the curriculum, these green competencies. So aside from embedding green competencies in the curriculum, we also have to develop skills to respond to the green jobs and identify these green jobs uh, with our with the support of the interagency and with the DOLE. So I think um, somehow we're 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 in the right track. And um, in terms of the of the, the green uh, digital, um, we are work. We will be working on having our uh, doing the digital roadmap as well in terms of not only for internally, but of course for the whole sector. So we're looking at that for the whole Tibet sector. So, um, yeah, for the government, it's just that um, all of this we will be doing with with a lot of help, not just for with us, but uh, as I as mentioned by uh, Martina and Sherwin here, we have strengthened the industry board so that we will be able to work with them in terms of all of this emerging and uh, in demand that we, that so that we could really respond to what uh, the industry would be needing for the digital and the green. Okay, there's a question for you from Zoom, but before I read that question, yeah. I'll go to Sherwin first. Uh, you mentioned the benefits of artificial intelligence. I think it's quite obvious. Uh, one example that I thought of while you, while you were talking about it, I heard that retailers are actually making practical use of AI in terms of copywriting. Let's say they want to advertise their uh, merchandise online, so they just have to type what they need. And AI, chat GPT, would do the copywriting. So that mm -hmm. saves time. Mm -hmm. But again, that comes at a high cost to the environment. I mean, can you talk about certain... Um, short-term, at least immediate ways that we can do to be able to somehow cushion the impact of the use of such beneficial technology on the environment? I think it's really learning how to use efficiently these uh, tools. Um, prompt engineering, again, um, I think, well, prompt engineering unlocked really the these generative AI tools for everyone uh, to see. So I think we really just need to be conscious first um, um, that yes, uh, these are very, very helpful tools, but they do have some effects on, on the uh, environment because of the, the, the computing resources that uh, they need. So it's imperative for us to learn how to properly use these tools. I mean, I use ChatGPT, for example, to, to create outlines for presentations. Um, before ChatGPT, it was very important for, for me or for, for those who, who teach, right? We, we need to know, okay, what's the objective of the presentation? Who is the target audience? How long do I have? Okay, Those are the basic questions that we, we do when we present. It's going to be the same thing here. If you actually provide the context, the topic, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the audience, okay? um, the, the, the mode of presentation, um, do you want to be more professional, more uh, jovial, for example, in your, your presentations? And you put that in one line in, in ChatGPT, it will definitely save a lot of computing resources. So with just one uh, statement, okay, with all of the things that we, we are, we, we are, you know, we use, uh, we used to do normally, okay, it saves time. Of course, you can do that one prompt at a time, but again, every time that you create a, a prompt, that's going to generate again some effects in the, in the uh, environment. That's actually new knowledge for me. <laughs> I'm going to cascade that information. So try to save uh, energy <laughs> by asking everything in one prompt. 
Okay. <laughs> Let's now go to Ms. Aquino. So how do you see the hospitality industry evolving to become more resilient in the green and digital economy? Oh, we have to make sure that we are on top of things. How many of you have stayed in a hotel for like more than three nights? More than three nights. How many of you have seen notices on the table that would say, if you don't want your towels to be changed, hang it? You've seen that. How many of you have experienced on the following day, your towels have been changed, even if you put it up there? So what training do we need? Training is needed to make sure that everyone who is part of the system uh, is knowledgeable about the initiatives that you have. So just like a typical hotel, you've got somebody, the big bosses maybe think of, okay, let's save on uh, uh, washing of towels. They do not translate it to training to the staff. And so even if there is a green initiative already that you have in the hotel, the staff are not aware of the value or maybe the reason, the objective of this. And so it has to go from the top all the way to the bottom. We've got to make sure also digital transformation. I remember, you know, I finished my program in 1980. <laughs> took my practicum then and when we were working in the hotel preparing for a guest arrival you'd have to type out type out several you know carbonized paper etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, it was really very consuming in terms of time in terms of materials that we had but right now with a uh, property management system there's no need to actually type print out all of these materials. You can just easily use any system. In fact, there are some that are licensed, some that are free, but what you need to do is make sure that the students are aware of this. Uh, it saves on labor because you know, a lot of people are scared that, oh, their jobs are going to be at risk if they embrace digital transformation. I keep saying that, I keep telling everyone, it actually affords you now to have a relationship with guests. Because instead of, you know, typing, being busy, doing so many things, oh, Mr. So-and-so, you have been with us. Uh, how was it in the last two months? We haven't seen you because the data is already there in your, in your computer. You're able to say, would you like the same room? Would you like the same? You know, if you are familiar with your guests and you have all of this information at the back, you've got, to, you, you already have everything uh, at your fingertips. And all you have to do is make sure that the guest actually feels very welcome in your facility. So we've got to make sure that we embrace this. We're not going back to what it was in 1980. We've got to move forward. And these things are, you know, uh, even destinations. Uh, I was going in, I went to a destination. I said, how many years has this been uh, existing? Uh, wait, a, wait a minute, mom. And, you know, so, the, you know, you've got an external brain already that helps you provide information. Uh, I've seen, I've spoken to some editors where they actually accept uh, chat GPT, gen uh, AI generation generated research, but the onus of making sure that everything that you put in your paper is something that is valid, that goes through extensive validation to make sure that you can still put your name to that particular paper. So there is a lot of things that moving. If we don't move, you're going to be left behind and all your competitors will move forward. You're left behind. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. We're going to end in uh, five minutes. Um... <laughs> So one more question for Dr. Sharp, and then we'll have one final question for all our panel members. Uh, the question for you, Dr. Sharp, is uh, do you see a role for digitization in sustainability transitions in the labor market? And perhaps you can also talk briefly about the barriers, uh, let's say, in terms of uh, achieving the circular economy in the textile and garments industry. And perhaps you can mention uh, certain barriers that you have observed in the Philippines. Okay. Sure. Uh, yes, digitization can absolutely help. Uh, and, you know, there will be labor market impacts. So help in sustainability transitions. You know, there's there'll be new opportunities, lots of discussion of those already, new jobs, new ways of working, um, and also opportunities to have more sustainable business models or um, practices. So whether that's, you know, hanging the towel up or using... Um, you know, buying secondhand clothing. Um, and, we, you know, we can also develop uh, skills in, in more, um, as, as the colleague from Tester said, you know, having ability, digitalization gives us ability to develop online learning in new 
customised ways, accessible, affordable, quickly, uh, and that's something that we'll need if we are going to, um, you know, get the workforce ready for the green transition. Um, I guess one of the main ways that digitisation has um, impacted in sustainability in the textile and garment sector is particularly in enabling um, in innovation and entrepreneurship with small uh, garment manufacturers, such as in, in the Philippines, garment manufacturers and designers. So oh. these can be small um, uh, designers or brands that can really use digital platforms to get that global reach. And so they can reach customers that are really demanding those sustainable um, aspects of garment production in a way that that wasn't possible uh, earlier on. So I guess that's kind of one of the, the main areas where we've seen um, sustainable garments be able to, uh, you know, scale with uh, digital platforms. Okay, thank you very much. Now, the final question for our, all our panel members uh, is this. Given that the Philippine labor market is polarized and workers considerably differ in skills and training, what key policies should be pursued to ensure just, equitable, and sustainable transitions? So we'll start with Dr. Sharp. Oh, okay. Uh, it's you great. again. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, I think. The, the whole concept of just transition needs to be front and centre in, in kind of thinking about how um, this transition plays out in the labour market. So ensuring that, yes, we do transition, but we do it in a way that no one is left behind. And so that means, you know, having that broad-based approach to digital literacy, um, paying attention to the gender dimensions of, of the transition as well. Um, you know, lots of points about policy coherence and coordination, you're very much in the front uh, of that, I, I would say, with the Green Jobs Act. It's very much the uh, admired from uh, some of your compatriot countries uh, in ASEAN. So I think you've got a lot of good things to build from. Um, but, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sharp. We'll now hear from uh, Ms. Aquino. Oh, sorry. Uh, I guess one number one would be uh, collaboration. You, there has to be strong collaboration, not just with academe, but government, as well as industry, to make sure that what industry needs is actually uh, implemented in school, or if it needs the support of government, maybe some strategy or some, some uh, circular can be done. You've got to make sure also that your curriculum is very updated. Uh, never mind if the training regulation, the curriculum guides, or the PSGs are like five years old. There is still a way that you can update your curriculum. How? By making sure that the course content is actually something that can be checked every year. I remember some faculty members who would have their, their materials, uh, what's this, uh, yellowed already because they've not changed their content in a number of years. So I guess faculty immersion is also very important because they know, you know, you cannot teach what you do not have and sometimes the only companion the teachers would have would be books and so you've got to make sure that you're also immersed in industry i'm very happy to say that state universities and colleges right now are beneficiaries of a step up grant which is actually 25 million worth and it allows them to actually enhance their uh, their facilities do uh, research do uh what is uh immersion etc but i think i, I guess the biggest hurdle is uh, equipment. And so many of them are focusing on that. But the thing is, you've got to make sure that you're on top of what industry needs. And you can't do that by just working with your, within your group. You've got to make sure that you're part of a bigger system, whether a professional organization, part also of maybe TIBFI, the Tourism Industry Board Foundation Incorporated, or any professional organization. Mind you, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Beth Aragon, who is actually now the Secretary of the Tourism Industry Board Foundation in together with uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Alan Tang as well. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to uh, Sherwin. 
Um, I think in, in alignment with um, Ma'am Christina and um, Charlene here, um, in, in the theme of uh, human capital development and, you know, not really wasting any uh, effort or duplication of efforts for, you know, the going uh, green, uh, there is this, you know, initiative within DTI and DIC on the creation of the Philippine Skills uh, Framework. Um, the, the intent is to really define career paths competencies and proficiency levels for major sectors. We already have skills framework for supply chain logistics, uh, human resource development, um, game, anim uh, game development, animation. We're going to have a Philippine skills framework for analytics and artificial intelligence. What it allows us is that it, it's, it's a very agile, you know, adaptive skills framework that you know, educational institutions, even TVET can actually use to define what are the the, 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 the training uh, needs, okay? So that ties up nicely with the Philippine Qualifications uh, Framework. And uh, I think I'm, I'm happy to actually hear that there's already an, an agreement, I think, between TESDA and CHED about the Philippine Credit Transfer System, which is also, I guess, again, in in the theme of not putting to waste whatever training you have. You know, whatever you might have trained in, in Tibet might be credited in a uh, higher education uh, program. Okay, So um, I think with, with those, you know, once we implement those in our education program, you know, at least um, we will have very more efficient you know, uh, education for, for the country. Thank you, Sherwin. Then finally, uh, Sherlene, but before that, uh, we'll try to squeeze in, squeeze in this question from Zoom. Uh, can TESDA create a competency training program for digitalized cultural mapping? Um, yes. Okay, go ahead. It's then the, the, the final question. Creatives and go ahead. The IBS. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this, this has been mentioned that we have to pursue collaboration. So that's, I think, one very important thing for us in the government, um, uh, especially for TESDA. Um, we have, uh, I mentioned that we have been working with this, with my co-panelists here uh, for the tourism and for the analytics. And I, I think we cannot really overemphasize with this discussion. Um, we, we need our people. So we need human capital development. So we really have to uh, invest invest in them. So part of that is really developing uh, the requirements of the industry so that they could really um, find work and also not just find work, but of course, also contributing to the economy, both, I mean, the requirements for the digital and the green. So with that, um, we will be uh, pursuing all of these uh, policies that in which Tibet played uh, plays a very important role. Um, uh, the Philippine Qualifications Framework, we have the Philippine Skills Framework, which, uh, which is also an input to what we are doing in terms of really identifying the, the requirements that we need to develop for the industry, in a particular industry. So um, we will also be aligning, of course, we have the NTESDP, so that's the plan in which we will be operationalizing by the development of the regional and provincial plans, which we will be doing in such a way that it's really an operational plan. Um, we will be having the skills mapping because we have the, I mentioned about the area-based demand-driven TVET in which we are really doing it at the local level. So identifying the specific skills requirements. So this, the regional and provincial plan will really be the skills map requirements of the particular uh, locality uh, and addressing also, of course, the, in the, the particular sector industry in that particular area. So moving forward, those are the plans that we have for the TVET sector. Um, Remember, um, the, the NTSDP, the plan is not just, it's, it's not a TESDA plan. So this is for the whole Tibet sector. So that's why we need all of them, our stakeholders in terms of really doing, uh, implementing such uh, all of the programs, the strategies that we have identified in that plan. So uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, I mean, TESDA and in, in engaging us in this conversation. Okay. So thank you very much to our panelists. So that ends our second plenary session for today, uh, please be back at 1.30 uh, uh, p.m. in this hall. Uh, in the meantime, please enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much to our panelists. <laughs>